Chapter 2 South Africa Disregard the Screamers Cecil Rhodes, the son of an English vicar, left home as a 17 year old in 1870 to join his brother Hubert growing cotton on a farm in South Africa. The crop failed, but the brothers found work at the recently opened diamond fields of Kimberley. Rhodes attracted the attention of the Rothschild agent Albert Gansey, who was assessing the local prospects for investments in diamonds. Backed by Rothschild's funding, Cecil Rhodes bought out many small mining concerns, rapidly gained monopoly control, and became intrinsically linked to the powerful house, house of the Rothschilds. Although Rhodes was credited while transforming the De Beers consolidated mines, into the world's largest, into the world's biggest diamond supplier. His success was largely due to the financial backing of Lord Natty Rothschild, who held more shares in the company than Rhodes himself. Rothschild backed Rhodes not only in his mining ventures, but on the issues of British race supremacy and expansion of the empire. Neither had any qualms, but the use of force against African tribes and their relentless drive to increase British dominance in Africa. It was, of course, an action destined to bring war with the Boers farmers of the Transvaal. In 1877, by the age of 24, Cecil Rhodes had become a very rich young man whose life expectancy was threatened by ill health. In the first of his seven wills, he stated that his legacy was to be used for the establishment, promotion, and development of a secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be for the extension of British rule throughout the world, the perfecting of a system of emigration from the United Kingdom, and of colonization by British subjects of all lands wherein the means of livelihood are attainable by energy, labor, labor, and enterprise, and especially the occupation by British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, the whole of South America, the whole United States of America, as an integral part of the British Empire, and finally the foundation of so great a power as to render wars impossible and promote the best interest of humanity. Rhodes' will was a sham in terms of altruistic intent. Throughout his life, he consorted with businessmen driven by greed and did not hesitate to use bribery or force to attain his ends if he judged they would be effective. Promotion of the best interest of humanity was never evident in his lifestyle or pra business practices. Advised and backed by the powerful Rothschilds and his other inner core secret elite friends, the Rand millionaires Alfred Beat and Sir Abe Bailey, whose fortunes were also tied to gold and diamonds, Rhodes promoted their interest by gaining chartered company status for their investments in South Africa. The British South Africa Company, created by Royal Charter in 1889, was empowered to form banks, to own, manage, and grant or distribute land, and to raise a police force, the British South African Police. This was a private police force owned and paid by owned and paid for by the company and its management. In return, the company promised to develop the territory it controlled, to respect exist existing African laws, to allow free trade within its territory, and to respect all religions. Honeyed words indeed, because in practice, Rhodes set his sights on ever more mineral rights and territorial acquisitions from the African people by introducing laws with little concern or respect for tribal practices. The British had used identical tactics to dominate India through the East India Company a century earlier. Private armies, private police forces, the authority of the crown, and the blessing of investors was the route map to vast profits and the extension of the empire. The impression that Rhodes and successors always sought to give, however, was that they did what had to be done, not for themselves, but for the future of humanity. Imperialism has long been a flag of convenience. The chartered company recruited its own armies, 
as it was permitted to do, and led by one of Cecile Rhodes' closest friends, Dr. Leander Starr Jameson, waged war on a Matabel tribe, on the Matabel tribes, and drove them from their land. The stolen tribal kingdom, carved in the blood for the profits of financiers, would later be named Rhodesia. It was the first time the British had used the Maxim gun in combat, slaughtering 3,000 tribesmen. Leander Star Jameson was born in Stradner, Strad Strandir, Scotland. He trained as a doctor in London before emigrating to South, America, South Africa, where he became Rhodes' physician and closest friend. Jameson was more responsible for the opening of Rhodesia to British settlers than of any other individual. Than any other individual, his place in history's hall of infamy was reserved not by the thousands of Matabels he slaughtered, but by the abortive attempt to seize Boar's territory in the Transvaal. To further his grand plans, Rose had himself elected the legislator of Cape Colony and began extending British influence northward. His most ambitious design on the continent of Africa was a railway that would run from Cape Town to Cairo, which could effectively bring the entire landmass under British control. It would link Britain's vast colonial possessions from the gold and diamond mines of South Africa to the Suez Canal, then on through the Middle East into India. It would similarly provide fast links from southern Africa through the Mediterranean to the Balkans and Russia, and through the Straits of Gibraltar to Britain. Every link in that chain would hold the empire secure. Whoever was able to control this vast reach would control the world's most valuable strategic raw materials, from gold to petroleum. <clears throat> in 1890, when Rhodes became Prime Minister of Cape Colony, his aggressive policies reignited old conflicts with the independent Boers Republic of the Transvaal and the Orange River Colony. The Boers Farmers were descendants of the African colonists from northern mainland Europe, including Holland and Germany. Many Africaners remained under the British flag in Cape Colony, but in the 1830s and 40s, others had made the famous long trek with their cattle, covered wagons and Bibles into the African interior in search of farmland to escape from British rule. A number settled in lands of, to the north across the Orange River that would become the Boar Republic of the Orange Free State. Others trekked on beyond the Val River into what became the Transvaal. Further north across the Limpopo and Zimbezi Rivers lay the African kingdoms of the Matabel tribes. Like the British settlers, many of the Calvinist Boers were racist. But whatever their shortcomings, they were excellent colonizers with the moral code that was far better than that of the money-grabbing, gold-seeking imperialist filibusters who were the friends of Cecile Rhodes. The British government had promised not to interfere in the self-governing Boar's Republic, but that was prior to the discovery of massive gold deposits in the Transvaal in 1886. Prospects of untold wealth raised the stakes and created a new gold rush with a large influx of fortune-seeking prospectors from Britain. By the 1890s, the Boers' Republic had become increasingly problematic for Rhodes. They did not fit easily into secret elite plans for a unified South Africa, nor his dream of the Trans-African Railway. The explosion of wealth in the Transvaal immediately transformed its importance. Political control lay in the hands of the rural the rural backward Bible bashing Boers, while economic control was increasingly in the hands of British immigrants, sucked into the interior by the gold rush. These outsiders, or Udalanders as the Boers termed them, had money but no political power, despite the fact that Udalanders' numbers in the Transvaal rapidly rose to twice that of the original Boer settlers. 
President Paul Kruger disbarred them from full citizenship until they had settled for a minimum of 14 years. Kruger had left Cape Colony, aged 10, to trek northward with his family and never outgrew his hatred and suspicion of the British. His government placed heavy taxes on mining companies and made it impossible for the Utilanders to acquire citizenship. Two convenient reasons for the British to find fault. British Boer conflict was all about the Transvaal gold. The secret elite wanted it and decided to take it by force. In December of 1895, they planned to provoke the Utilander uprising in Johannesburg as an excuse to seize the Republic. Cecil Rhodes' close friend, Dr. Jameson, the British South African Company's military commander, simultaneously launched an army raid from across the border to support the uprising. It was a harebrained scheme cooked up by Rhodes and British-born Johannesburg business leaders with the support of the British government. Alfred Beatt and other members of the secret elite were deeply involved in planning, financing, and arming the assault of the Transvaal. Months before it was due to take place, Rhodes disclosed his intentions to a close friend and member of the secret elite, Flora Shaw the South African correspondent of the Times. Shaw was a pioneering journalist in her own right and had worked closely with Stead on the Paul Mall Gazette. She was a personal friend of John Ruskin, who had encouraged her in his, her writings. Thereafter, she wrote pro utilander anti-Boer articles in the London paper to prepare public opinion in England and grease the past path to war. Lord Albert Gray, yet another member of the Inner Corps and the director of the British South Africa Company, sought official support from the uprising from Joseph Chamberlain, the, col the colonial secretary in London. Chamberlain was also given advance notice of the raid by the liberal leader, Lord Rosebery. The uprising never materialized, for the Utilanders were neither as unhappy nor as oppressed as Flora Shaw portrayed them in the Times. Word of the intended raid had been leaked in Johannesburg, and President Kruger had his forces ready. Jameson and his men were surrounded and captured. The entire venture was a fiasco. Rhodes was forced to resign as Cape Colony's Prime Minister and ordered to London to appear before a parliamentary select committee. He became the focus of an international scandal that could have fatally damaged the secret elite, something akin to a panic sent urgent something akin to panic sent urgent messages flying between the conspirators. Immediately Rhodes disembarked in South in Southampton. He was met by Natty Rothschild carrying a confidential message from Joseph Chamberlain, who had secretly approved the raid. In political terms, Chamberlain could have been obliged to resign, but that would have left the secret elite even more vulnerable to relentless recriminations. Rhodes carried official telegrams he had received from Chamberlain that exposed the colonial secretary's complicity. A deal was there to be done. Consequently, this damning proof was withheld from the select committee, and the government made no attempt to limit the powers of the Royal Child Roads British South Africa Company. It was an exercise in damage limitation. In London, Royal Child, Escher, Stead, and Milner met urgently to determine the secret elite strategy of denial. Barefaced lies were presented as truths. Chamberlain secretly visited Jameson in prison, and the good doctor agreed to keep his counsel. Whatever happened in law, Jameson knew that the secret elite would ultimately protect him. In a further defensive move, Sir Graham Boer from the colonial office was persuaded to offer himself as a scapegoat. Bauer, Boer, Bauer, who had person personally handled negotiations between London and South Africa, agreed to lie before the, committee, by, before the committee by insisting that Chamberlain knew nothing about Jameson's raid. Edward Fairfield, Edward Fairfield, another colonial office civil servant who had handled the London end of the negotiation, 
refused to follow Bauer's lead and give false testimony. What incredibly good fortune for Chamberlain, Rhodes, and the secret elite that Fairfield suddenly died of a stroke. In a manner that would become a regular occurrence down the years, every major witness who appeared before the select committee, committee lied under oath. Prime Minister Salisbury, a member of the inner circle, insisted that Chamberlain himself should sit on the committee. When witnesses refused to produce documents or respond to questions, they were not pressed for answers. Whole fields of inquiry were excluded. The secret elite were thus able to whitewash all of the participants, save Leander Star Jameson, whose position was impossible. He had, after all, been caught in flagrant, in flagrante, in a flagrant. He accepted sole responsibility and spent just a few weeks in prison. The raid proved a setback for Rose in terms of personal position, for he had lost the respect and support he had previously enjoyed from many Boers. He and his moaning friends regrouped while the storm blew over, but the Transvaal gold was always unfinished business. It's always unfinished business. Soon after, pliant journalists began once more to flood Britain with propaganda about the alleged plight of the Udalanders. The Jameson raid elevated President Kruger's President Kruger to legendary status in the Transvaal. He set about transforming his small army into an effective force of some 25,000 commandos, armed with the most advanced guns and rifles. Combined with forces from the Orange Free State, the Boers could muster 40,000 men for action. Kruger was re-elected president of the Transvaal for a fourth term, and his standing amongst the Africaners there and in the Cape had never been higher. Cape Colony contained a majority of Africaners, though it was governed by Britain. Naturally, British rule was adversely affected both by the raid and Kruger's growing popularity. Rhodes had put, a risk, had put at risk the very survival of that part of the British Empire to which he had dedicated his life. How ironic that the lure of gold drove him to reckless stupidity. Of greater, of greater irony was the fact that he and Jameson were saved from the eternal ridicule by the man who would pay the ultimate penalty for appearing to challenge the British Empire. The German Kaiser sent a telegram on January 3rd of 1896 to Paul Kruger, congratulating him on preserving the independence of his country without the need to call for aid from his friends. Kaiser Wilhelm's, Kaiser Wilhelm's telegram was portrayed in Britain as a veiled threat of Germany's willingness to support the Boers in any struggle against the empire. The jingoistic British press raised the lasting storm of anti-German sentiment. The Times misconstrued the Kaiser's note as an example of brazen German interference and proclaimed, England will concede nothing to menaces and will not lie down under insult. The windows of shops owned by Germans in London were smashed and German sailors attacked in the streets. In sharp contrast, the German diplomatic response was conciliatory. Taken aback by such unexpected reaction, Wilhelm replied to a letter from his grandmother, Queen Victoria. Never was the telegram intended as a step against England or your government. But the tide of public opinion has been turned and it was in no mood to turn back. A, a tawdry jingoism, jingoiz, jingoiz, jingoism filled the air. And a new respect was found for Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes and Dr. Jameson. The secret elite propaganda machine turned Jameson's violence into an act of her heroism, heroism and converted a shambolic, potentially very damaging incident to their advantage. Jameson, the butcher of the Matabelle, was rewarded with a dictatorship with the directorship of the British South African Company and would 
later be made Prime Minister of Cape Colony. Though his secret elite colleagues had saved him from derision and public disgrace, Roe's leadership was damaged. He remained a totally ruthless servant of the empire, but his reckless attempt to oust the Boer government revealed the lack of political cunning. Worse, he had left behind a trail of complicit embarrassment that stretched back to the colonial office in London, and he was viewed by even his colleagues as a potential liability, a spent force. The secret elite required some of, someone of intellect, intelligence, and political astuteness to lead the secret society, pick up the pieces and reestablish British authority in the wake of the embarrassment caused by Rhodes in South Africa. One man fitted the bill perfectly, their man, Sir Alfred Milner. Milner's appointment as High Commissioner of South Africa was a coup for the secret elite. It was a post he had decided to take long before it was offered to him. The dangerous political tensions required a clear solution and could not be trusted to a less determined man. Milner was prepared to give the empire the leadership it required by taking control of the South African government and confronting the Boers. His friend and colleague in the Society of the Elect, William Waldegrave Palmer, second Earl Saborn, recommended him strongly to the recommended him strongly to the colonial secretary at the same time as his other secret elite colleague, Lord Escher, was making at second, uh, his friend and colleague in the Society of the Elect, William Waldegrave Palmer, second Earl, uh, second Earl Selborne recommended him strongly to the colonial secretary at the same time as his other secret elite colleague, Lord Escher, was making a similar approach to the Queen. A fair measure of the influence that the secret elite could exert inside the British government. The message put about by his friends was that Milner would have to be free to start de novo, pick his own team, and be allowed to make his own decisions. Chamberlain's first degree with the new appointee remains a closed book, but though they differed in terms of the immediacy of a war. It later became apparent that both knew that it would be the only answer. Chamberlain insisted on patience because he had been personally damaged by the fallout from the Jameson raid. He had to be sure that the public was, were behind him. Milner advocated an entirely different case for working up to a crisis. The difference between the two was temporal, and Milner used every contact he had in the press he had to press the case urgently, even though it meant going behind his own boss's back. Milner had been knighted for his services to the nation in 1895, but his promotion to high office in South Africa was spectacular. At the farewell dinner held by the secret elite in his honor, Milner was praised to the heights. Stead stated, Stead stated that he was an imperialist of the purest water who would be relied upon to do all that, he, that can be done to make South Africa from Table Mountain to Tangikia, Tanganyika, as loyally British as Kent or Middlesex. The dinner was organized by Lord Curzon, Curzon and chaired by the future Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. The guest list included Lord Rosebery, Sir William Hancourt, Lord Goshen, Alfred B Arthur Balfour, and Richard Haldane. These major British political figures had gathered to salute Sir Alfred Milner, one of their own, who ended his speech with a personal declaration that he was a civilian soldier of the Empire. How appropriate. It was the man who would take up arms for the British race to which he was forever sworn. On the 14th of April, 1897, Milner set out for South Africa on a personal crusade to make it as loyally British as the Garden of England. He would remain there for eight years, cement his role as leader, and build a team of brilliant young acolytes to drive the secret elite's agenda forward for the next 30 years. His mission was absolutely clear. 
govern South Africa, all of it, remove Boer obstacles to complete British domination and take the Transvaal gold. Milner knew it would mean all-out war. He also knew that the only way to make such a war acceptable to the cabinet and British public was to portray Kruger's Boers as the aggressors. Sir Alfred Milner barely, rarely met with Rhodes in South Africa, but kept in constant touch using Edmund Garrett, member of the Society of the Elect and newspapermen, as an intermediary. Milner felt that it was politically necessary to conceal their relationship, for Rhodes' reputation had been badly damaged and he was absolutely detested by many Boer communities. In his first year in the Cape, Milner traveled around assessing the situation and weighing up alternatives. His appointment shortly after the raid disturbed the Boers, for he was known to be a determined Empire loyalist, and they had every reason to fear his unspoken intentions. In private letters to the colonial secretary, he stated very plainly that there was no way out of the political troubles in South Africa except reform in the Transvaal or war. And at present, the chances to reform in the Transvaal are worse than ever. Although Chamberlain reminded him that their agreed strategy was to play the waiting game, that was precisely what Milner had no intention of doing. He was supported at every turn by Chamberlain's undersecretary, Salborn, Selborne, who wrote secret and confidential letters to Milner in South Africa appraising him of Chamberlain's view and insisting that he must have a free hand and be backed up through thick and thin from here. Sir Alfred Milner returned to England in 1898 to build support for an active and resolute policy of action. He traveled between London and the great watering holes of the secret elite, where he briefed members including Lord Curzons and Rosebery and Rothschild. He visited Arthur Balfour, conservative leader in the Commons, and his former Balliol College classmate, St. John Broderick, the man who within months would become Secretary of State for War. Here, for the first time, the reader can see exactly how the secret elite worked. The colonial secretary persisted in his stance that Milner should delay until both public opinion and parliamentary objection had been turned in favor of war. Milner was straining at the leash because he knew that delay would only make the empire look weak. He ensured that his own network prevailed. Joseph Chamberlain was effectively circumvented by his official representative in South Africa, and had he known, there was nowhere he could turn to complain. The High Commissioner was invited to Windsor's castle by Queen Victoria, advised, of course, of led by, led by Lord Escher, going, before going to Sandringham, where a very affable, affable future King Edward VII was anxious to have his advice. Milner instructed all the key members of the secret elite that there would have to be a war, whether his titular boss, Joseph Chamberlain, wished it or not. Every one of these powerful individuals understood Milner's message. There was going to be a war in South Africa, and they had to be ready to stand by him through what were certain to be difficult times. Milner moved effortlessly from one front in which he was already the acknowledged master to a second where his contact base was equally impressive, the press. The British army would be going to war and the British public had to be softened up by the jingoism that would sweep all before it. The reaction to Kaiser's telegram had provided ample evidence of the public's aptitude for exonophobia xenophobia. But Milner needed support too in the South African press. He recruited W.F. Moni Penny from the Times to edit the Rand Star. Edmund Garrett, editor of the Fortnightly Review, was a loyal and trusted friend, and E.T. Cook at the Daily News, whose career Milner had advanced, was now trumpeting his virtues and supporting his solutions. In Britain, Harmsworth's Daily News, with the circulation of in excess of 500,000 copies per day, was unstinting in its support for Milner and war. The crisis, as far as the British public was made concerned, had nothing to do with the Transvaal cult. 
is stem from a disagreement about the limited rights of the Udalanders and their ill treatment by the Boers. The reader will immediately understand how much vested interest members of the secret elite had in Britain's imperial designs in South Africa. Rhodes, Alfred Beatt, and Abe Bailey all ran millionaires, and Lord Grey were directly involved in the British South Africa Company, and like the House of Rothschild, had serious financial and business investments that required to be protected. In truth, the coming war was all about the gold mines, but was dressed as a clash of British immigrant workers' the rights against the Boers' oppression. One journalist no longer applauded all that Milner did. One important voice who had initially been a committed supporter, as well as one of the original three conspirators, turned against them. William Steed had attended an 1898 peace conference at the Hog, at the Hog, undergone conversion to a different faith and returned as an apostle of international arbitration. He publicly criticized Milner, who could clearly see was steering Britain into a completely unnecessary war. And their long friendship and his role in the secret society ended acrimoniously. Absolutely convinced of the brutal logic of his own analysis, Milner never wavered. British control of the Transvaal was essential, even though it meant war. The only question that remained unanswered was how to bounce Paul Kruger into making the first move. Consider the reality of Kruger's Transvaal. Boers were increasingly a distinct minority. Certainly, there were many British workers among the Udalanders, but a large minority were Africaners from the Cape, Germans, Frenchmen, and even, Af and even Americans, all white and earning good money. The fact that they were effectively disenfranchised was a genuine concern to permanent settlers. But what did that matter to the internet, to the in Intern, internant workers. Intern, intenerent. What did that matter to the intenerent workers? What possible incentive did they have to overthrow the Kruger's government? None. Life under the Union flag promised no great advantage to the mass of gold diggers and mine workers whose dream was to make a fortune and return home as wealthy men. In truth, the Jameson raid had largely failed because the Rhodes was hopelessly overestimated the Rhodes had over, had hopelessly overestimated the strength of feeling amongst the Udalanders. Milner did not leave such a basic prerequisite to mere chance. He needed a genuine uprising from an angry and frustrated community that could appeal to the British government for help. Dissent had to be fermented throughout the Udalander's population. To this end, Alfred Beat wanted to unleash his Johannesburg agent and rabble rouser, rabble rouser Percy Fitzpatrick. But one major obstacle stood in its way. Fitzpatrick, arrested and jailed during the Jameson raid, had been paroled on conditions that banned him from any political activity or criticism of the Kruger's government. Quite incredibly, he was released from the, this bail condition by the Transvaal State Attorney and free to stir Udalander outrage at the shooting of one of their members, at the shooting of one of their number in his own home by a trigger-happy Boer policeman. 5,000 protesters took to the streets and salt was rubbed into the wounds to the wound when several Udalanders were arrested and set bail conditions five times higher than the police gunmen at the center of the storm. According to Fitzpatrick, those arrested were in the Market Square in Johannesburg simply to present a petition to the British Vice Council, but were taken into custody under the Public Meeting Act. Bitter recriminations spewed forth with Fitzpatrick pointing out that for taking the life of a British subject, 2,000 pounds bail, 200 pound bail was sufficient, but for the crime of objecting to it, bail was set at 1,000 pounds. The cause became one of trampled civil rights. 
Fitzpatrick encouraged further protest meetings in Johannesburg and a petition was signed seeking redress through the British government. It was exactly what Milner needed, a popular case. Late in March of 1899, Milner met secretly with Percy Fitzpatrick in Cape Town and gave him instructions to continue stirring unrest and to feed damaging stories about Kruger to the British press. Fitzpatrick was dispatched to London to present the Udalander case to the British public. His book, The Transvaal from Within, became an instant bestseller promoted by the secret elite. Jan Smuts, the Transville state attorney who freed Fitzpatrick from the shackles of his parole, warrants considered attention. Prior to the Jameson raid, Smuts had been Cecil Rhodes' close friend, trusted confidant, and personal agent in Kimberley. The 27-year-old Cambridge-trained lawyer believed passionately in South African unity under British rule, where both British and Dutch would settle their differences and coalesce in into a single white nation. His admiration was such that he saw Rhodes as the very man to carry forward this great ideal, and he became a vigorous supporter of the United South African, the South, the United South Africa within the British Empire. Then he completely changed tack, apparently disaffected by the unlawful attempt to occupy the Transvaal by force. He abandoned his political philosophy, denounced his good friend Rhodes, and reinvented himself. His, conver his conversion from Anglophile to Anglophobe was conveniently explained as a road to Damascus moment. Born again as Rhodes' most vociferous critic, his violent anti-British agitation and uncompromising support for Kruger quickly yielded results. Despite his age and lack of experience, Kruger made him state attorney in Transvaal and his chief political advisor. Smuts' anti-English rhetoric and other draconian measures soon enraged the Udalanders. In addition to their lack of voting rights, they complained bitterly about the levels of taxation, the state control of mining supplies, and what they considered as a system of blatant ex extortion that took their wealth from Johannesburg and transferred it to the Boers in Pretoria. In Pretoria. Smuts' constant provocation of the Udalanders was strangely at odds with the President Kruger's attempt to calm the rising unrest, including a major concession on voting rights after just five years' residence instead of the previous 14. He was even prepared to grant preferential mining rights and reduce taxation levels. This was Kruger's great deal, an astonishing turn of events that could have placated the dissenters and restored confidence in his government. While the president was granting concessions and attempting to dampen down agitation from the anti-board press, Smuts seriously undermined him by arresting newspaper editors sympathetic to the Udalander cause. Smuts was hell-bent on stirring Udalander outrage. Strange indeed that in so short a time, Rhodes' former close friend and ally was doing everything in his power to ensure that Milner got the one thing he and Rhodes most desperately wanted, war. Smuts sensed a wavering in the political ranks and sent a memorandum to the Transvaal executive in September of 1899, urging them to take the necessary steps to become one of the great empires of the world. An African Republic in South Africa stretching from Table Bay to the Zambezi. This was virtual secret elite speak, reminiscent of Rhodes, though it was voiced to upset the Udalanders. Cape Africaners begged him to avoid war, accommodate the Udalanders, and placate the British government. Smuts would have none of their wise counsel. He retorted vehemently that if it was to be war, then the sooner the better. Our volk throughout South Africa must be baptized with the baptism of blood and fire. Two voices argued war, Milner and Smuts, apparently implacable, apparently implacable enemies. As each week passed, tensions heightened. British troops' movements unnerved Kruger who could see that the Transvaal was threatened with invasion. 
British troops' movements unnerved Kruger, who could see that the Transvaal was threatened with invasion. By October of 1899, large numbers of British troops were sent to the Transvaal border in what was a calculated provocation. Kruger demanded their withdrawal, but Milner's response was to deliberately escalate the tension by sending yet more troops. Milner got his war. Both the British and Boer representatives rejected the terms they demanded of each other. And to Milner's delight, Kruger approved an ultimatum written by the Smuts that accused Britain of breaking the 1884 London Convention, drawn up after the First Boer War of 1880 and 1881. The text of the ultimatum was received in London with derision, delight, and disdain. The Daily Telegraph didn't know whether to laugh or cry. The editorials rejoiced in the fact that Mr. Kruger had asked, has asked for war and war he must have. It was all to be over by, treat, by tea time. Boer soldiers advanced to Cape Colony on October the 12th of 1889 to attack an armored train supplying, carrying supplies to Mafeken. And so began the Boer War, exactly as Milner had planned. Kruger, in exasperation, made the first move before the British could bring even more troops into South Africa and was forever held to be the aggressor. In truth, he had been outmaneuvered. Milner had the grace to confess in a letter to Lord Roberts, commander-in-chief in South Africa, that I precipitated this crisis, which was inevitable before it was too late. It was not very agreeable, and in many eyes, not a very credible piece of business to have been largely instrumental in bringing about, my big, in bringing about a big war. This was no immodest boast or rampant exaggeration. Milner's matter-of-fact explanation displayed the cold objectivity that drove the secret elite's cause. War was unfortunate but necessary. It had to be. One year before, in a private letter to his friend, Lord Selborne, Milner explained very clearly that the backward, almost medieval Boers could not be allowed to control the future of South Africa. The race oligarchy the Boers, had got to go, has got to go, and I see no sign of it removing itself. The solution was simple. If they would not go, they had to be removed, and his placemen, Percy Fitzpatrick and James Muntz, had played their allotted roles in helping him participate that inevitable crisis. With a force that peaked at almost half a million men, more than double the entire Boer population of the Transvaal against an estimated 40,000 Boers in the field. The British expected an easy victory. Easy? The first principle of Boer tactic was mobility, and though they were vastly outnumbered the Boers, and though they vastly outnumbered the Boers, the British army found it difficult to pin them down. The Boers' guerrilla warfare proved frustratingly effective against the military mindset anchored in Wellington's traditions. The war lasted almost three years and became the bloodiest, costliest, and longest that the British Army had fought in almost a hundred years. The Boer War provided little or no cheering news for the British public, but one report grabbed the national headlines and fired the imagination. It brought a young man with huge ambition to the public eye in a blaze of glory, though the accounts of his Indiana Jones adventure lacked the rigor of any independent cooperation. Winston Churchill had been sent to South Africa as a war correspondent for the conservative Morning Post in 1899 and ended up in a Boer prisoner of camp, war camp. The story, as it, has been, as it was largely his, derives from Churchill's autobiography. According to his own account, he joined a recognizance, a reconnaissance mission aboard an armored train on, 15, on the 15th of November, 1899, and was captured among, along with around 60 British officers and men when the Boers attacked it. Taken to Pretoria, 
they were held in an old school surrounded by 10 foot high corrugated iron wall surrounded by a 10 foot high corrugated iron wall Churchill gave an account of the derailment and his subsequent action in making a daring escape to other journalists the Daily Telegraph printed a dispatch from Reuters headline Mr. Churchill's bravery and coolness is described as magnificent the hero created himself what went unreported was that following the intermittent following the internment churchill wanted himself classified as a non-combat non-combatant on the grounds that he was a journalist he used his connections to send a begging letter to alfred milner on the 24th of november asking that he be included in the list of prisoners to be released and said that he had asked his mother to write to him through milner he also submitted a request for his release on the 26th of November and 8th of December and promised that if I am released, I will give any parole that I may require, that I may be required not to serve against the Republican forces. On December 12th, the Boer commander-in-chief agreed to release him, and sometime, after, there, and sometime thereafter, Churchill was never seen in the camp. On his subsequent arrival in the Portuguese port of Lourenço, Marquis Churchill relayed an amazing adventure. He claimed to have cut through the fencing under the noses of the Boer guards and made a torturous journey to freedom. His daring escape became the stuff of a legend. On his own and unable to speak either African or Kafir, but bolstered by the surprisingly large sum of 75 pounds, worth over 6,000 pounds in today's currency, he made the 250-mile journey to the safe haven of Lorenzo Marquis. His odyssey was worthy of any Greek hero of ancient myth, crossing dangerous terrain and dodging the heavily armed Boers commander who were out hunting for him. He eventually came to a railway track and le leaped onto a train as it thundered past. This must have been accomplished with considerable difficulty, partly because of his dislocated shoulder. In another fawning account, Churchill is said to have hurled himself upon a truck and after an agonizing struggle managed to remain crouching on, a couplings on the couplings between two wagons. Within a very short time, however, thirst forced him to leap off in search of water. Crawling on his belly, he dragged himself through swamps before coming across the Boers township of Whitbank. It was unbelievably fortunate to knock on the door he was unbelievably fortunate to knock on the door of the only family for twenty miles where he would not have been handed over. After three days in hide of hiding, allegedly in the company of rats down a mine shaft, he got on board another railway truck and concealed himself under bales of wood. It was the train of the Delagoa Bay freedom and a blaze of triumph that is how churchill told the story controversy hung around his account like the rats in his mine shaft there were accusations that he had behaved selfishly and badly by leaving on his own and creating such self-seeking publicity fortune and determined legal proceedings however seemed to have removed such reservations british officers in the camp Captain Haldane, Sergeant Brocky, and Lieutenants Le Monsieur and Franklin felt that he had ruined their chance that he had ruined their chances of freedom. Haldane's claims were strengthened by his refusal to appear in court on Churchill's behalf in a libel case against Blackwood's magazine in 1912. Despite these contrary voices, his daring escape turned Churchill into a public hero and gave to him a, a conservative seat for Oldham in the parliamentary elections just a few months later. Quite apart from the hero that was Churchill, British confidence ran well ahead of reality, and the Boer War proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that the British Army was not fit for purpose. The war altered Milner's direct control of South African affairs, 
for the conduct of military operations was not within his lim was not within his remit. Perhaps he should have been very grateful, since fault for the many military embarrassments that followed could not be laid at his door. For Alfred Milner, war was a beginning, not an end in itself. What mattered was winning, controlling the gold fields, and then weaving the reconstructed South Africa into the fabric of the empire. And though it was a dirty war, dominated eventually by General Kitchener's tactics and the obscenity of British concentration camps, Milner learned a great deal that would be useful to the secret elite in the War of 1914 to 1918. The military incompetence prior to Kitchener's arrival as Chief of Staff to Lord Roberts was alarming. Kitchener, however, proved to be difficult. He was not a team player. He was appointed by the War Office as a troubleshooter, cutting through red, tra cutting through red tape, an organizer who rarely played second fiddle, and not a man to give way to politicians. In Kitchener's eyes, War was the responsibility of the armed forces, not civilians. He, in, he tended to be consumed by his own authority and did not listen to other points of views. When he altered the army's transport system in the middle of the war, despite the warnings of those who knew the South African terrain, the professional transport officer prophesied disaster, and it duly followed. Kitchener of Khartoum became known locally as Kitchener of Chaos. The one fear that Alfred Milner carried in his heart, the one prospect that filled him with greater horror than a protracted war and the misery it brought, was the prospect of Kitchener offering the Boers a negotiated peace. Kitchener believed that by 1901, peace was both practical and desirable. Milner thought otherwise. He had, he had not gone through the painstaking troubles of engineering this war simply to engage in a compromise through peace talks. Writing to Violet Cecil, the woman he could later, the, the woman he would later marry, Milner admitted, "My only fear is that he may make he, as in Kitchener, may make promises to people to get them to surrender." which will be embarrassing afterwards to fulfill. His vision for a future South Africa was pre predicated upon outright victory and the total subjugation of the Boers to the British Empire. He dreaded a botched up settlement, a kafir bargain, as he called it. Quite apart from the gold, an early peace would not only save the face of the Boer leaders, but also preserve their identity as a political force. This was, this was Milner's nightmare scenario. He wrote in January of 1901 to Richard Haldane, the liberal minister, the liberal member of parliament whom he trusted most, that there was no room for compromise in South Africa. They must be out and out victors. The big difference between them was that Milner knew the grand plan, Kitchener did not. Winning the war was a necessity, but winning the peace in Milner's eyes was a complete necessity. He ensured that peace talks failed by directly lobbying the conservative cabinet through the secret elite in London. He was adamant there would, should be no talk of amnesty. Kitchener's lack of political nuance Political nuance, nos, political nos, was revealed when he complained bitterly to the Secretary of State of, for War, St. John Broderick, that Milner's policy was absurd and wrong. Milner's view may be strictly just, but Milner's view may be strictly just, but they are, to my mind, vindictive, and I do not know of a case in history when, under similar circumstances, an amnesty has not been granted. Given that Broderick was Milner's close personal friend from Balliol College, 
and party to all that he went and party to all that he went to South Africa to achieve. Kitchener simply undermined himself. Sir Alfred Milner returned to London in May of 1901 to assert his position and stifle the resolve and stiffen the resolve of any doubters. A reception committee that included government members of the secret elite met him at Waterloo Station. All the major politicians were waiting on the platform as the train drew in. Prime Minister Lord Salisbury and his nephew Arthur Balfour, leader of the House of Commons, led a delegation that included Lord Lansdowne, the the Foreign Secretary, and the Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain. Sir Alfred Milner was whisked off through cheering crowds to Marlborough House, where his friend and the newly crowned King Edward VII rewarded him with the brother with the Order of the Bath, made him a privy councillor, and raised him to the peerage as Baron Milner. It was a public display of undiluted homage to the leader of the secret elite. Within weeks, the cabinet adopted Milner's policy in South Africa as their policy. Kitchener had been outmaneuvered, and Lord Milner immersed himself in preparing the ground for success, continuing the war, reopening the mines, ensuring the flow of wealth to his backers, and getting the best of British talent into his own administration. With his power confirmed absolutely, Milner returned to South Africa, where the brutal war continued for another year full, another full year. The Boer War started badly for Britain in military terms, and no matter how the supportive press exaggerated the small successes, its popularity ebbed thanks to two infamous causes that the liberal opposition made their own. The first was the public outcry that grew from one of Milner's rare mistakes. The British welfare campaigner Emily Hobhouse, armed with credentials credentials from liberal MPs whom Milner trusted, solicited permission from him to visit the so-called refugee camps. What she saw there fired her sense of moral indignation, and rightly so. Set up as part of Kitchener's attempt to win the war, the concentration camps were, by any standard, abominable. From November of 1900, the British Army had introduced new tactics in the attempt to break the Boers' guerrilla campaign. Kitchener initiated plans to flush out guerrillas in a series of systematic drives, organized like a sporting shoot, with success defined in a weekly bag of killed, captured, and wounded. The country was swept bare of everything that could give sustenance to the guerrillas, including women and children. Some 30,000 Boer farms were burned to the ground and their animals slaughtered. It was the clearance of civilians, virtually ethnic cleansing, uprooting a whole nation that would come to dominate the public's perception of the last phase of the war. A total of 45 camps were built for Boer internees and 64 for Native Africans. Of 28,000 Boer men captured as prisoners of war, almost all were sent overseas. The vast majority in the camps were women and children. Inadequate shelter, poor diet, total lack of hygiene, and overcrowding led to malnutrition and endemic contagious diseases such as measles, typhoid, and dysentery. Coupled with the shortage of medical facilities, over 26,000 women and children were to perish in the British concentration camps. Emily Hobhouse's Dispassionate, The Brunt of the War and Where It Fell, published in 1902, was more than just a political bombshell. It exposed the disgusting truth about how Britain was conducting war against women and children. She detailed cases where every child and families of ten had perished in the camps, where Dutch charities were forbidden to provide much-needed condensed milk when it was freely available in Pretoria, and how, as a consequence, children were dying like flies. The wives and children of men fighting for the Boer army were punished by 
being put on half the already meager rations and given no meat whatsoever. W.T. Stead was overcome by the evidence presented to him and wrote, Every one of these children who died as a result of the halving of their, nation, of their rations, thereby exerting pressure onto their families still on the battlefield, was purposely murdered. The system of half rations stands exposed, stark and unashamedly as a cold-blooded deed of state policy, employed with the purpose of ensuring the surrender of men whom we were not able to defeat on the field. All of this was conducted expressly on the orders of the British authorities. Concerted attempts were made to dismiss Hobhouse's revelation by claims that she was slandering British troops, but her expose fired the liberal leader Campbell Bannerman's, and Campbell Bannerman's outrage over the method of barbarism. The method of barbar the methods of barbarism being used against the Boers. It was a phrase he hammered home time, home time and again against the conservative government. It was followed by another attack on the government by the virulently, virulently anti-war Lloyd George on the 17th of June, 1901. He railed bitterly as at his opponents. Why pursue war against women and children? And pointed out with scathing derision that the rate of, mora of mortality amongst children is higher than amongst the soldiers who have, who have braved all the risks on the field. The following months, when statistical returns from the camps arrived at the war office, it was clear that Hobhouse's worst fears had been confirmed. There were 93,940 whites and 24,457 blacks in camps of refuge. And the crisis was becoming a catastrophe as the death rates grew higher and higher. To Milner, the life or death of 18,000 Boers and African civilians there in rated as an abysmal, abysmally low priority. Friends like Richard Haldane dismissed the utter tra tragedy of the concentration camps as a great mess caused by the military authorities. But no one should forget that Milner was morally responsible for the camps. He was the High Commissioner. Ten months after the subject had first been raised in Parliament, Lloyd George's taunts and Campbell Bannerman's harsh words had been fully vindicated. In the interval, at least 20,000 Boer civilians and 12,000 Africans had died. Lesser men would have been hounded from office, but Lord Alfred Milner was no lesser man. The war was costing the British government around two and a half million pounds per month, and as the Secretary of State of war for War, St. John Broderick, pointed out to Kitchener, they could not profit from any victories until the wheels of the gold mines began to turn. Milner, too, was anxious to restart, re restart production. His secret elite millionaire colleagues were dependent on him to pressurize Kitchener into reporting the Rand's mines, and, his duly hap and this duly happened. There is no doubt that the Boer War was about mining rights and ownership of the Transvaal gold. One immediate consequence of war, however, was that the gold stream dried up. The great mines like Robinson Deep and the Ferreira emptied their boilers, laid down their huge steel-crushing stamps, and stopped all production. The Utilander workers turned into panic-stricken refugees, who only added to the chaos and fear in Johannesburg several operating mines were allowed to flood lest the gold fell into Boer's hands, but in November of 1901, a small amount of dewatering began again. Such was the urgency given to restarting the profit stream. Milner believed that the military commander's role was to win the war and accept the enemy's unconditional surrender, not discuss terms of surrender or negotiated peace. 
His hackles were raised in ninth of March of 1902 when the Boers agreed to meet with Kitchener, not him to discuss peace. When the Boers agreed to meet with Kitchener, not him to, not to discuss peace. Not him to discuss peace. An urgent secret telegram was sent to London advising the colonial secretary that Kitchener's involvement could profoundly upset plans for the future administration of South Africa. Milner knew that Kitchener was very anxious to end the war and get away to India and had no appreciation of the impact that dangerous concessions could make. Both Chamberlain and Milner agreed that the Boers needed to taste outright defeat. Just days before peace negotiations finally began, Cecil Rhodes dies, died at his home near Cape Town. It was the end of an era. Milner's place in the secret society was consolidated by his apostolic succession as leader, just as Rhodes had wished. Though in truth, Milner had assumed office after the Jameson raid. When the British delegation presented the Boers with terms of unconditional surrender, it was Jan Smuts who drew up their immediate acceptance. Smuts who drew up the ultimatum and Smuts who penned the proposal to accept Britain's terms without delay. So quick to go to war, so ready to grasp surrender. Had he undergone a second road to Damascus conversion? Or was he always a secret elite placement? The Treaty of Verigning, Verigning was signed on May of 31st, 1902, and in consequence the Boers Republic were annexed to the British Empire. The winner took all. It, was all. it has always been so. The Transvaal Gold was finally in the hands of the secret elite at the cost of 32,000 deaths in the concentration camp, including more than 20,000 children. 22,000 British Empire troops were killed and 23,000 wounded. Boer's casualty numbered 34,000. Africans, Africans killed amounted to 14,000. More British soldiers were killed by enemy fire in the Boer War alone than in all Great Britain's colonial wars in Asia and Black Africa from 1750 to 1913. The British mobilized nearly half a million soldiers, of whom 450,000 were sent directly from the mother country. Milner's war proved costly in human terms, but he regained the gold mines. Lord Milner was elevated to Viscount Milner by the appreciative Edward VII on July 1st of 1902, and weeks later sworn as a governor of the Transvaal and the Orange River Colony. Discriminatory laws that had been enforced against non-whites remained untouched, and the policy of white supremacy continued. Milner was vexed to find that many of the troops whom he hoped would stay to populate South Africa were leaving because of economic prospects that looked bleak. He desperately wanted to root the empire's future in the potential wealth of South Africa and urged Chamberlain in London to help him boost immigration by aiding the reconstruction of the country. He dreamed of developing a wider sense of British patriotism in South Africa, far in excess of that present in Canada or Australia, and was prepared to stay and fight for it. In September of 1902, after being handed the keys to 10 Downing Street by his uncle, Arthur Balfour asked his friend Milner to return home to take up the post of colonial secretary. It was unquestionably an acknowledgement of his high standing. Milner refused, even when the king made it known that he was the royal choice. Milner stayed on to complete his task. He made it clear that Alfred Littleton, another member of the inner circle of the secret society, should be appointed, and so he was. The microscopic example demonstrates how the real power inside the secret elite worked. Milner held sway as their leader, and neither the prime minister nor the king denied him. 
Who else in the empire would have dared override such authority? Theoretically, they had the power to insist Milner did as he was instructed, but both the head of government and the head of state bowed to his wishes and respected Milner's deep-seated view that completing the task in South Africa took priority. Viscount Milner turned his attention to the practical business of transforming the country into a model British dominion. He administered the Transvaal and the Orange River colony as occupied territory, recruiting into the upper layers of his civil service a band of young men whom he had mainly recruited from his beloved Oxford University. This group, which became known as Milner's Kindergarten, replaced the government and administration of the two former republics and worked prodigiously to rebuild the broken country. Milner's Kindergarten Milner's kindergarten comprised new blood from the best universities. Young, educated men with a deep sense of duty and loyalty to the empire and capable of populating the next generation of the secret society. Milner's connections with All Souls and Balliol was particularly important in providing suitable recruits for his personal administration. This challenge, the challenge was formidable he estimated that there would be a short but important period after the war during which the British population could be increased through immigration. Prosperity would return when the gold mining industry was restored and the hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, civilians in concentration camps, and native laborers were resettled. 30,000 burned out farms, smashed railway lines, and a communication system in tatters would have to be restored. Thereafter, a united self governing white community supported by black labor would see the benefits of being, the, being in the British Empire and want to become a vital and permanent part of it. Milner needed men of quality to serve in the reconstruction of South Africa. He was determined to enlist the very best brains with the greatest possible energy for the task ahead. Oxford friendships, contacts with the colonial office, and personal association with Milner were a good starting point, but above all, they had to share his commitment to the empire. What marked out these young men, a collection of mere and minor colonial administrators in 1902, is how their careers blossomed under the patronage of Alfred Milner and the secret elite. Of the 18 men appointed by Milner to his administration in the kindergarten, nine of them attended New College, Oxford, four went to Balliol, five were also fellows of all souls, and everyone proved to be a Milner loyalist. They were endowed with good fortune, education, and family connections and were skilled in personal relations. Though Milner's patronage and membership of the secret elite, they would all go on to high office in the British government and international finance and become the dominant influence in British imperial and foreign affairs for the next 40 years. The unrelenting litany of political, academic, and journalistic achievement of the men from Milner's kindergarten is unparalleled. Ponder for a second on the likelihood of such success from any random group of university graduates in any period of history. They became viceroys, secretaries of state, permanent secretaries, governor, generals, ambassadors, knights of the realm, managing directors, banksters, industrialists, members of parliament, members of the House of Lords, editors of major newspapers, professors of history, members of war cabinets, writers and guardians of the great imperial dream. These men were recruited by Alfred Milner, molded, trusted, and proven able. They went on to become the secret elite's imperial guard, the physical proof of its triple penetration of politics, the media, and education. They were fired by his total dedication to the cause, and South Africa was their testing ground. Whatever else, Milner recruited and built formidable teams, and as a result, had at his beck and call an unrivaled network of talent on which to draw for the rest of his life. 
The post-war reconstruction of South Africa, coordinated by the kindergarten, generated a general boom in work throughout the country and further huge profits for the secret elite. There was no incentive for the African workforce to return to the old jobs down the mines because higher paid work was plentiful elsewhere. Furthermore, mining was very dangerous work with scant regard paid to worker safety. Deaths in the mines averaged 71 per, 71 per thousand workers in 1903. With the figures in July that year, exceedingly one man killed for every 10 miners. Human life was being sacrificed after a purgatory of toil and ter torture for a wage of 50 cents a day. But investor profits were good. Milner and his and the mine owners were so desperate to augment the declining workforce that drastic measures were agreed. They looked to China, where there was a large source of surplus and cheap labor. The Chinese were lured, lured to the South African mines with false promises and outrageous lies. They were led to understand that they would be living in pleasant garden cities where once settled families might join them. Fit the healthy applicants were select filthy, fit and healthy. Fit and healthy applicants were selected, and kept in sheds until embarkation. Then, under armed guards, they were loaded into the holds of ships for the journey. The first ship to sail, the three thousand four hundred ton iron hulled SS Iqbal left China on the 30th of June, 1904, with over 2,000 men cramped in the hole, cramped in the hole like a classic 18th century slave ship. It was midsummer, with the temperature over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. As the Iqbal headed out for its 26-day voyage through the tropics, by the time it, it arrived in Durban, 51 men had died and their bodies dispatched overboard. The death proved no great loss to the organizers, however, for they had insured each man for $125 and netted a tidy profit from the insurance company. On arrival, the men were tagged like pieces of meat and sealed in railroad cars for the 30-hour journey to the Transvaal. The garden cities were a myth. In reality, the Chinese workers lived in huge hutted compounds beside the mines, with 20 men in each small shack. They were unable to leave the compounds without a special permit and were fined for the slightest breach of the rules. The men worked 10 hours a day for a wage of 25 cents. In addition, they had to work at lower rates for at least six months to pay back the cost of their passage from China. If any man failed to carry out his allocated work, he could be flogged and given a heavy fine. Although it was illegal, Milner approved the flogging of the Chinese workers as a, as a necessary sanction, and the conservative government backed him. It was an act of classic old-fashioned imperialism. Many who could not keep up with the back-breaking toil were in perpetual debt to the mines. If still alive after three years, they were to be shipped back to China like spoiled return goods. These Chinese were brought over in the prime of life to be broken on the wheel within three years for the purpose of grinding out ever greater profits for the monsters of greed who owned them. The problem of Milner was that he underestimated the impact that allegations of slavery and reports of vicious floggings would have on ever his trusted liberal friends like Asquith, on even his trusted liberal friends like Asquith. Indeed, Milner was at times such a driven man that he failed to take account of the weight of opposition raged, ranged against him. He warned his friend, Richard Haldane, if we are to build up anything in South Africa, we must disregard and absolutely disregard the screamers. It takes a very strong man to disregard the screamers. 
to ignore moral indignation, to put the cause before humanitarian concerns? Some frontline politicians find it all but impossible to stand against a torrent of public outcry, but those behind the curtains in the secret corridors of power can easily ignore a sentimentality. Remember those words. They will reverberate through the pages of this book. Absolutely disregard the screamers. By 1905, public opinion in Britain had clearly turned against Milner, and with the general election due, he decided that the best way forward was for him to withdraw from South Africa. Officially, the word was that his health was suffering under the strain of the momentous task of reconstruction. He was allegedly burnt out. Always in charge, Milner chose his moment carefully. It was, a vital, it was vital to the secret elite that a change of government did not result in a change of imperial policy. Secret negotiations that would have long-term implications for foreign British policy were already taking place behind closed doors in London. Milner was needed there. His African quest could be left safely to, to his trusted kindergarten. And Milner went so far as to nominate his secret elite friend, the Earl of Selborne, as his successor. In fact, Selborne was not too happy as being sent to the South Africa, but he obeyed sent to South Africa, but he obeyed Milner, who wrote directly to Prime Minister Balfour saying that Selborne's appointment left him feeling the greatest possible relief. Yet again, it was the leader of the secret elite who chose his own trusted man to continue the fight in South Africa, even though he did not particularly want the post. Viscount, Viscount Milner was well rewarded by his banking and industrialist friends for the tireless work he did to reinstate and increase their profits. Within a year of his return to England in 1905, he was made a member of the board of the London Joint Stock Bank, later the Midland Bank a director, later chairman of Rothschild's Real Tint Company, Tinto Company, a director of the Mortgage Company of Egypt and of the Bank of the British West Africa. So many lucrative posts were offered to him that he was forced to refuse, amongst others, a directorship of both the Times and the Arnaments' giant Armstrongs. Milner had a political vision for a union of South Africa based on a great influx of British immigrants who would magically transform the language and the culture, but a severe drought wasted much of the agricultural land in 1903 and 1904, and his dreams never materialized. While the veneer of British supremacy covered the reality of African consolidation in the longer terms, the mines were back in full production once the Chinese laborers were in place, and profits flowed back to the grateful international bankers who underwrote the investments. Political pressure from London and other parts of the empire appeared to restore much of the autonomy of the former Boer republics, and it was considered that a liberal government would continue such a process, but Milner's war had not been in vain. He left behind an impressive structure of able administrators dedicated to rebuilding the colonies. Furthermore, the secret elite's agents were in place through South, throughout South Africa. The most compelling evidence that Jan Smuts was one of them is to be found in his activities after the Boer War. Professor Quigley revealed that Smuts was in the secret society's inner core and gained international fame chiefly because of this membership. Just as he had done before his supposed defection to the Boer War, to the Boer's cause, Smuts worked diligently for a union of South Africa under the British flag. Although the Prime Minister of the Transvaal was General Louis Botha, Jan Smuts was the dominant political figure. When the first cabinet of the new Union of South Africa was formed in 1910, it was largely Boer with Louis Botha as Prime Minister. The real power, however, was retained by Jan Smuts, who held three out of nine important portfolios and completely dominated Botha. Years later, the secret elite held a banquet in Smuts' honor in the House of Parliament, with Milner sitting 
at his right hand side. Smuts was always one of them. And what of Jameson, butcher of the Matabel and leader of the Shambolic Raid? Without even a blush of embarrassment, Milner made him Prime Minister of Cape Colony, a suitable reward for his loyal service in silence. An attempt was made in 1906 by Liberal members of Parliament to put down a parliamentary motion that would name Viscount Milner and publicly shame him for permitting Chinese laborers to be flogged in the Transvaal. It was intended as a severe censure from the House of Commons, but was subtly amended by Winston Churchill, who had by this time reinvented himself as a liberal member of Parliament. He deliberately gave the impression that Milner had been sufficiently punished, was without income, and no longer had influence over anything or anyone. Churchill told Parliament, Lord Milner has gone from South Africa probably forever. The public servant knows him no more. Having exercised great authority, he now exerts none, no authority. Having held high employment, he has, he now has no employment. Having disposed of events which have shaped the course of history, he is now unable to deflect the smallest degree the policy, smallest, deflect in the smallest degree the policy of the day. Having been for many years, or at all events, for many months, the arbiter, arbiter of the fortunes of men who are rich beyond the dreams of avarice, he is today poor, and I will add honorably poor. After 20 years of exhausting service under the crown, he is today a retired servant, civil servant, without pension or gratuity of any kind whatsoever. Churchill's assurance that Milner had been retired permanently to some mythical poorhouse was a monumental deception. Milner would know public service again when he decided. He was not poor and never would be poor. The men whom Churchill deemed rich beyond the dreams of avarice made sure of that. But of all the spurious parliamentary claims that Churchill made in defense of Alfred Milner, the most outrageous was that he's no longer able to deflect the policies of the day. It was the very image behind which the master manipulator could continue the work he had set himself to guide the empire to a necessary war. It mattered not a jot what Parliament thought of him. Perhaps the most difficult fact with which the reader has to contend is that the secret elite had an absolute belief that elected democratic government was no alternative to the kind of rule of the superiors which Milner's Oxford mentor Ruskin had advocated. Just as Ruskin held a deep-rooted disbelief in democracy and saw the true instrument of social progress in the goodwill and intelligence of the upper classes, so Milner held an absolute contempt for the British parliamentary system. He spelled it out in a letter in that he wrote in, in May of 1902. Our political organization is thoroughly rotten, almost non-existent. Never was there such an absurd waste of power, such ridiculous inconsequence of policy, not for want of men, but for want of any effective central authority or dominant idea to make them work together. This self-styled British race patriot learned many lessons during the Boer War that shaped the secret elite's future actions. The lack of backbone inside the British cabinet to stand up to the voices clamoring against the continuation of the war in South Africa deeply annoyed him. The power given to Kitchener and the manner in which the military commander made rash promises to placate the Boers frustrated his long-term ambitions for the country. Forthcoming elections, public opinions, newspaper campaigns, and political opportunism from liberals like Campbell Bannerman and Lloyd George turned his stomach. The ultimate success of the British race could not be left to the whim of political parties or changing government policy. Someone had to have the conviction to make hard decisions, to stand up to the screamers and disregard them. Milner was that man, and the members of the secret elite, the secret society, endorsed him without reservation.
He continued to generate secretly strategies and control political decisions, making in Britain from behind the drawn curtain. Making in Britain decision making. He continued to generate secretly strategy and control political decision making in Britain from behind the drawn curtain. He would go on to shape the course of history with a determination that was unbending fueled by the conviction of the race patriot. Summary, Chapter 2, South Africa, Disregard the Screamers. Cecil Rhodes accrued a great fortune in gold and diamonds in South Africa thanks to a massive investment made by the Rothschild family. He was granted a royal charter for the British South Africa Company, which permitted a private police force and army that was used brutally to grab more and more native territory. The Boers Republic were basically farming communities until the discovery of gold in the Transvaal transformed their absolute worth. Determined to take control of the Transvaal gold, Rhodes and his associates hatched the harebrained scheme to invade the colony. Its embarrassing failure threatened to expose the involvement of the secret elite in South Africa and London. Though the subsequent Parliamentary Select Committee of Inquiry whitewashed the conspirators, Rhodes' leadership was fatally damaged. Alfred Milner took the reins and had himself appointed High Commissioner in Cape Colony. His objective was to provoke war, even though the Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain advocated a no-war policy. Milner's secret elite's network neutralized Chamberlain, and Milner advised his associates that war was absolutely necessary. With the experience of the Jameson fiasco in mind, Milner used political agents to stir up unrest in the Transvaal. Jan Smuts, once Rhodes' close friend and confidant, allegedly defected to the Boers and was quickly promoted to the position of advisor to Kruger. Strangely, both he and Alfred Milner wanted exactly the same outcome, war. Despite tales of a boy's own nature garnishing Winston, Ch Winston Churchill's self-penned story of a glorious escape from a boy's prison camp, the war went badly from the start, and with British Army proving beyond doubt that it was not fit for war in the, in the veldt. Kitchener was drafted into the South Africa, was drafted into South Africa to win the war and settle the Boers. But he was not a team player, and his objective did not match Milner's. Kitchener wanted to surrender and conciliation. Milner wanted to crush the Boers and begin reconstruction under the built British flag. Milner appointed administrators, administrators of the highest quality, trawled mostly from Oxford, and they spared his vision of an all-imposing empire controlling the world. Two major problems emerged that damaged Milner's reputation. The first was his acceptance of a concentration camp system that caused the deaths of 32,000 men, women, and children. The second was the system of immigrant Chinese labor employed to get the gold mines back into full production. The use of flogging as a form of punishment caused public outrage in Britain. Milner returned to Britain in 1905, having left South Africa in the hands of his trusted placemen. The changing nature of European alliance became an issue that required his presence in London. But many valuable lessons were learned by Milner and the secret elite during the war in South Africa.